Since the founding, Americans had had fierce political arguments over topics such as the creation of a central bank, slavery, and westward expansion. But throughout, the relative independence of the individual states from the central government continued to be respected. The Kentucky and Virginia resolutions, written anonymously by Jefferson and Madison, asserted the then commonly accepted right of the states to nullify federal laws that contradicted the Constitution on its face, such as the Alien and Sedition Acts, which suppressed speech critical of the federal government. The Civil War, usually described as a war over slavery, was really fought in part over the question of whether the southern states had the right to nullify anti-slavery laws and tariffs passed by the northern dominated federal government. And therein lies a tension that would haunt the U.S. for another century and more. Freedom can obviously be suppressed by a central government, and freedom can sometimes be suppressed by individual states and defended by the federal government. But having the central government intervene to fix local affairs in the short term often erodes liberty in a more subtle way over the long term by setting a precedent that decreases the state's autonomy and imposes homogeneity. When all the states are subject to the same centralized code of laws, there is no easy way to escape bad laws by moving from one state to another. In the process of fighting the Civil War, Lincoln violently crushed the idea that the states were at liberty to participate or not to participate in the Union. He levied war against seceding states, though, ironically, levying war against any of the states is the one thing that the Constitution defines as treason in Article 3, Section 3. During the war, Lincoln also curtailed several freedoms by censoring and prosecuting an anti-war press, by unleashing troops who murdered civilians, raped women, burned courthouses, and robbed banks in the southern states, by blockading southern ports to prevent trade, by suspending habeas corpus and imprisoning some 16,000 suspected Confederate sympathizers in the North without trial, by spending money before Congress had authorized it, by introducing a draft, and by introducing the first and ultimately unconstitutional income tax. Lincoln was not impressed by the idea that the public should continue to criticize the government even in times of crisis. Would you heckle a tightrope walker in the midst of a delicate and dangerous performance? No, said Lincoln, quote, you would hold your breath as well as your tongue and keep your hands off until he was safe over. The government are carrying on immense weight. Untold treasures are in their hands. They are doing the very best they can. Don't badger them. Keep silence and we'll get you safe across." Unquote. He preferred safety over liberty. Does this sound familiar? But whether Lincoln liked it or not, the government had its critics. Resistance to the draft was so intense in New York City that rioting over the issue killed hundreds. But the draft would return during future wars and the income tax would be reintroduced in a far more permanent fashion a half century later by the so-called progressives, starting out quite modestly, but becoming a complex and pervasive tool for social control. The post-war South was subject to reconstructionist state governments imposed by the North, with former Confederate officials forbidden to run for office or even to vote, and loyalty to the military to the military occupiers required before one could even use the post office. The 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments declared an end to slavery, applied basic constitutional rights to all the states and all the people in them, and in theory guaranteed the right to vote to non-whites. Yet even after these measures, black Americans would face decades of being targeted for selective enforcement of laws, 
an easy way to replace slave labor in the South with labor by prisoners. Extrajudicial killings, lynch mobs, would reinforce blacks' status as second-class citizens. In many ways, the greatest leaps forward for liberty in the late 19th century United States were occurring not by legal fiat, but as usual, because of capitalism. The so-called Gilded Age was indeed a relative golden age of laissez-faire, with corporations becoming the dominant form of business, standards of living rising in a second wave of the Industrial Revolution, and stunning advancements in communications, including transcontinental and transatlantic telegraph lines, and in transportation, including cars, motorcycles, and zeppelins. For the first time in history, human lifespans began to lengthen significantly after averaging about 50 years during many prior centuries of subsistence level farming. Birth rates and immigration caused the U.S. to grow rapidly and with little federal interference. Aside from restrictions on lunatics and the carriers of diseases entering the country, only a quota on the number of Chinese limited immigration to the United States in the 19th century. Basically, you came here, you worked here, you stayed here. Pretty simple. Unlike today's presidents who believe in bailing out struggling businesses and providing welfare to corporations and to the poor, President Grover Cleveland did not even believe that the government should provide relief for struggling workers in terrible downturns, such as the Depression of 1893. Let the market sort it out, as it soon did. Just as America was moving in the direction of laissez-faire capitalism, though, intellectuals and elites and organizations of farmers and populists who grew to hate Cleveland were beginning to look in the opposite direction. They wondered what might be achieved by more government planning and whether bigger government might achieve wonders of coordination and planning as impressive as had the strides made by big business. Alas, things would not work out quite as they had hoped. <laughs>